Well, good evening and welcome once again to Quinston's Discipleship Training Course. Tonight's study is on baptism. Thanks, as always, to Pastor Chet Joins uh, for his work developing this series. He opens this lesson with a question. Uh, he says, now that you have completed six lessons dealing with the Christian life, you're probably asking, where do we go from here? Throughout these lessons, we've been using the Bible as our authority, so let's continue to do that. It's always appropriate and right for Christians to seek God's answers in God's Word. Tonight's study will teach us a foundational understanding of baptism, and we'll talk about the symbolism and the meaning behind it and why it's important to continue observing it in our lives and the life of the church. Before we get into tonight's study, our focus last week was on meditation and our memory verse came from 1 Timothy. It was a command given by Paul to Timothy regarding how meditation was to be used in the Christian life. Can you remember it? 1 Timothy 4, 15. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Meditation, we learned last week, is not exclusively a practice for the Eastern religions, but it's something Christians have been doing for centuries. In fact, they've been doing it for millennia since the... Uh, uh, Old Testament was written and the New Testament, so for over 3,000 years. In fact, Christian, uh, in the broadest sense, have been meditating since before Buddha uh, even existed. The important difference between Eastern and Western meditation is the content. As Christians, we meditate on God, the truths contained in His Word, His saving actions in history, and His nature. We meditate on his creation, uh, and so we get to know the Creator better through the creation. The focus of meditation makes all the difference in the world on the valuation of it. Deeply considering God draws us closer to Him. Let's turn our attention now to tonight's study on baptism. It's one of two sacraments of the church. In the next lesson, we'll learn about the other, which is communion. Now, the Roman Catholic Church observes seven sacraments. It helps me, if I'm trying to remember the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, to think of them as corresponding with the major phases of life, birth, childhood, adulthood, and death. Two are ongoing throughout every practicing adult's life and two are a one-time occurrence, uh, a sort of an either-or situation. Uh, then one happens as a person is preparing to die. If you think of it this way, baptism is, happens when we are born, confirmation happens when we reach adolescence, uh, we take the Eucharist uh, every week and confess regularly as ongoing practices uh, that the believer would engage in throughout the rest of their lives, and in early adulthood, usually, uh, the uh, Catholic practitioner has to make a choice between one of two things. They can either uh, pursue the sacrament of matrimony and get married, or they can pr pursue the sacrament of holy orders, uh, becoming a priest or serving as a nun. And then the final one, when death approaches, is the last rites or the anointing of the sick. In the Reformed Church and the Protestant Church, uh, we see sacraments as something that Christ commanded and something that Christ observed himself. Jesus was baptized and he commanded us to be baptized. Jesus ate the Passover and he commanded his disciples to eat it in remembrance of him. And so we have communion. Not only this, but uh, sacraments we see are essential, uh, essential ceremonial rituals that mark the believer. Baptism marks the initial connection with Christ and the church, and communion marks the ongoing connection between the same. I guess the first thing we should do is define baptism. The official definition of baptism in the Reformed Church, that is to say, uh, is it, uh, these sacraments are signs and seals of 
of the covenant. And by a sign and a seal, we mean that it is filled with symbolism and meaning in, in indicating the nature of salvation. And by seal, we mean it marks the person, signifying their connection to the family of God. Now, this may sound a little technical and a little bit um, uh, maybe abstract. So let's think of it in other terms as well. A couple things to remember as we define baptism is one, it's a ceremony. So when you think about the definition of baptism, we have to say it's a ceremony. That's what it is. It's a ritual uh, with symbol and meaning uh, deeply within it. And secondly, it's done with water. So baptism is a ceremony done with water. Third, it's done by Christians to Christians uh, since we were commanded to do it by our Lord. And fourth, it's done in the name of the Savior, excuse me, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So a ceremonial ritual done with water by Christians to Christians uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit uh, uh, marking uh, the Christian off from the non-Christian. These are really the aspects that all Christians pretty much agree on. Now, there's a lot of latitude within that. Those are pretty broad definitions we're talking about. Uh, if we take the time to think about it, uh, we could really start to break down a lot of differences and variations in how baptism is observed. Um, besides these few things, there's a wide array of things that believers uh, believe uh, and practice uh, when considering baptism. They uh, think about who should be baptized, and they differ on exactly uh, on, on, on all these questions. Who should be baptized, when they should be baptized, and in what fashion they should be baptized. For instance, should we baptize babies of believers, or only uh, those who are old enough to profess faith themselves? And that's uh, infant baptism versus believer baptism, or credo, meaning to believe, um, versus uh, pedo baptism, I meaning children. Um, uh, should we baptize, uh, when should, uh, when we baptize, should, what mode of baptism should we employ? Uh, generally speaking, when you baptize infants, you uh, use pouring or sprinkling, uh, you put the water on the baby. And when you do a believer baptism, it tends to be that you do more of what's called a full immersion where the uh, baptismal candidate is submerged fully underneath the surface of the water. But uh, even within that, there is a wide latitude in understanding of how it should be done. Uh, should we baptize uh, outside in nature or inside in the church building? Should we baptize with flowing water like Jesus was in the Jordan, a, a stream or a river, or in a pond? Or should we baptize in a pool or in a church baptismal font? Uh, you know, where should we be baptized? Um, how should we be baptized? Should we dunk a person? Uh, should we dunk them once or should we dunk them three times? Generally, those are the two options. We don't usually go with two or four or more. Um, it's one uh, once for the baptism or three times for each once for each of the names of the baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and if we're going to dunk them either uh, once or three times, should we dunk them leaning forward or should we dunk them leaning back? And again, uh, you can see both of these practices observed. And each and every viewpoint has its own reasoning and has its own following. Um, so there is some pretty wide latitude in how baptism is practiced. So at Gwinston, we fall into what is called the Reformed camp, meaning that our theology came out of the Protestant Reformation and reflects the teachings that come from that time, time period and those teachers. People like Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, John Knox, uh, Huldrych uh, Zwingli, and others. Uh, we believe that baptiz baptizing infants, the infants of believers, I should say, not just all babies, uh, although, you know, you've probably heard in the uh, Middle Ages with the Crusades, there was uh, enforced baptism of non-believers, uh, thinking that the baptism itself uh, conferred grace. We don't, uh, in Protestant church, believe that anymore. Uh, but 
we do believe that uh, baptizing infants of believers is appropriate. Uh, and it's appropriate when those believers make a commitment to teach their children to follow Christ. So let's talk about then why. And uh, we'll begin the process of unpacking the symbolism of baptism, which will take some time. The question on uh, your sheet, if you have that in front of you, uh, that is dealing that we're dealing with right now is the first one, which is what is baptism? We've already said that baptism is a ceremonial rite, recognizing a person's connection with God. They're a part of God's family. Presbyterians believe and teach that this faith connection is initiated by God and starts before we know it. Oftentimes when we are still very young, maybe in the womb, even uh, certainly while we are infants or children, uh, sometimes later than that. While some people have dramatic and powerful conversion stories, many other people cannot remember a time when they were not followers of Christ and did not believe. And so we see that as God's working in their infancy or toddlerhood or younger even. We look to the Old Testament to see how God worked there with his people and how he marked his people off there. And uh, we believe that he is still working in that same way. Particularly, we turn to passages like um, Genesis chapter 17, which uh, uh, God is speaking with Abraham and he makes a covenant with him. He promises many things to Abraham, uh, and in a sense, he sort of adopts Abraham as his own. Uh, but Abraham was supposed to do something in return. God wanted Abraham to stand out among the people, to be different. God wanted to put a sign on Abraham declaring him uh, to belong to God. That sign was circumcision. It was a sign to the people around Abraham as well as a constant reminder to Abraham that he belonged to God. That sign was circumcision and it was to be performed on the eighth day after a son was born. This became the sign and seal of God's covenant through Abraham. In the New Testament, Jesus uh, is the initiator of a new covenant, one that does not rely on our ancestry as Abraham's did. He had to be a descendant of Abraham to be included or become adopted into Abraham's family. But we don't need to be a descendant of Abraham um, to be a recipient of God's blessing. Now the blessing comes through our connection with Christ. With the new covenant comes a new sign. Instead of circumcision, we now have baptism. Just as God chose to include uh, individuals in his old covenant by having them be born into uh, Abraham's descendants, even while they were still infants, God still chooses who to become spiritually alive. And we see this connection between circumcision and baptism in passages like 2 Corinthians 11, 12. And I want to read that for you. In him also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, but with the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So uh, Paul here says that the circumcision of Christ is baptism. And so we see that circumcision, Old Testament circumcision idea connected here with the New Testament idea of baptism. So the question I guess uh, some people are still asking is, why do we baptize infants? Uh, and one of the things you can think about is that baptism is connected with discipleship. Uh, by, by Jesus in his Great Commission, specifically Matthew 28, um, and he says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So for the children of believers, this discipleship program starts at the very beginning, right as soon as they're born. We begin to disciple them. We pray for our children uh, even before they can speak. We read them Bible stories and sing them um, uh, songs of praise. Uh, even as infants, they're being exposed to the sights and sounds and smells of church worship. So deep within their hearts reside the sounds of praise and prayer, even from before the time they can speak or understand it. So they are being discipled 
uh, even from the beginning. And so baptism is tied uh, with discipleship. So what is the significance of baptism? That's the next question on our sheet. It's asking, baptism is an external physical event that symbolizes and points to an internal spiritual reality. It's been something the church has been practicing since biblical days. The apostles in Acts baptized people into the new faith and all down through the centuries, baptism has been practiced uh, to recognize those who were a part of God's family, the church, and those who were not. If you were baptized, you were part of the family, and if you were not, you were not part of the family. So we've already touched on the authority of baptism. If someone asks us, what gives us the right to act on behalf of God? You know, how is it that we presume to think that this is what God wants? We have an answer. How can we presume to do anything or claim anything that it is on behalf of God? The answer is simple. God told us to do it. In the Great Commission passage I read just a minute ago, Jesus commanded us to baptize disciples in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we see the church obeying this in passages like Acts 2.38. When the crowd asks the Apostle Peter uh, in the midst of his sermon what they should do, to become God's children, to be followers of God. He said, repent and be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit. Then all through Acts, this sort of thing happens over and over and over again. Now, both baptism and communion are ways of communicating something important. If baptism, in baptism, we have no less than four things that are being communicated. First, it declares that we are connected with Jesus. The Galatians passage uh, describes our connection like that of clothing. We are wearing Christ like a garment. And we know that as Christians, what we do influences what people think about Jesus. They see, uh, they see him when they look at us. In Colossians, which uh, we already talked about, uh, we are reminded that our baptism is a picture of death, the death of our connection with our sinful self, and his resurrection points to our being made alive spiritually through our faith in him. Uh, John 15, 4-6, Jesus uses the picture of the connection with the branch as a plant uh, to the trunk of the tree or the vine. Uh, we get our nourishment and life through that connection. So baptism reminds us of that connection. So one of the things that baptism declares is our connection with Christ, making and declaring that to be a reality. It's a, it's a statement of that connection. And the New Testament talks about that connection in different ways, as we have just seen. Baptism also declares a second thing. It declares the removal of sin. In Romans 6, 3 to 10, we're reminded of that picture of death in baptism. But here, that is to remind the believer that the death that they experience uh, um, separates us from our sin. I want you to listen to Romans 6, 3 to 10. Paul's speaking and he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So there's the connection with death. Verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order to that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And so uh, one of the things that our baptisms declare is that Christ died to sin and through him we also died to sin. Christ's physical death became for us a uh, 
spiritual sort of death in the in the sense that it broke our connection to sin death breaks connections uh, when you die uh, the connection of marriage is broken uh, the law no longer applies you're dead and so there's a breach and a break of the connection there and in this sense baptism and the the death of our souls with Christ on the cross is a death to sin which means we can be alive spiritually and set free from that bondage and from that slavery so baptism uh, uh, declares uh, removal of sin uh, another thing that baptism declares comes from Galatians chapter 2, 20 and 3, 13. Uh, and we see the same concept in both um, this kind of death to sin. Uh, I'm sorry, I said we were going on to a new one. This is a reinforcement of that same one, death to sin. Uh, Galatians two twenty says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I'm dead. Christ is living in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Our connection with Christ through baptism reminds us of the fact that Jesus died. One of the things that he did uh, was to die for us. His death was our death. Think of it that way. God's judgment against us then was met in that death because we died through Christ. So in a sense, it was us who were dying and through that death, we we're being torn away from sin. We we're being broken away from sin. The penalty for our sin is being paid and therefore it no longer hangs like a chain around our neck. You can think of that old um, picture of um, Jacob Marley visiting Scrooge, walking around with the chains that he forged in life. And uh, that, you know, when we die, in this sense, uh, God is breaking us from those chains. And so that spiritual death through Christ in the crucifixion frees us from the chains. We'll talk more about this uh, when we consider the symbolism of baptism, but we're still talking about what that baptism declares. Let's, let's go on to our next declaration aspect. Uh, back in Romans 6 passage, uh, we see another declaration. Uh, we saw that Christ uh, died, that we saw that we died Christ's death and separated us from sin, but there is also a strong reality in which we live again in Christ uh, because of this. And uh, here in verse 4 of Romans 6, just as Christ was raised from dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life verse 5 for if we have been united with him in death like his we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his down to verse 8 now if we have died with christ we believe that we also will live in hit with him so it declares our death to sin and our life to christ or our life our eternal life our spiritual aliveness Finally, uh, baptism declares our submission to Jesus as our Lord. We're declaring him to be our master. When we go back to the idea that we have put on Christ, like Galatians 3.27 says, we have this picture of wearing Christ like a garment. But it's more than just clothes that, that cover our bodies. Think of it as a uniform. Uh, with a uniform come certain requirements uh, in how we conduct ourselves. In the army, for instance, if you're wearing a uniform, uh, you must salute superior officers. And if you don't, you face uh, punishment. Uh, you're supposed to act in certain ways. Same thing is true if you put on another military uniform or a police uniform or a firefighter's uniform or a nurse's uniform or a doctor's uniform um, or any number of other uniforms. The garments that we wear say a lot about who we are. So when we say that we are wearing Christ, it's saying that we are acting like him. In, in other words, he's our Lord. What he says, we do. In the Great Commission on uh, Matthew 28, not only are the apostles commanded to go and make disciples and baptize them, but they are also supposed to teach them to obey everything Jesus commanded them to do. 
Obedience is a telltale sign of a follower of Christ. So submission to Jesus is why we get baptized, and it declares our intention to live under his authority. So that's the, the fourth thing that we're looking at, uh, uh, baptism as declaring. Now, the um, fifth question on your sheet deals with baptism's symbolism. Now, baptism is replete with symbolism. Uh, some of them are obvious and some not so much. Let's move through uh, some of these. And I've, I've highlighted here five of them. Um, so let's look at each in turn. The first and perhaps the most obvious for us is washing. Baptism is a picture of God's washing of our souls. We see this in places like Acts 2.38 and 22.16 and Titus 3. Uh, Acts 2.38 be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So there it doesn't specifically say about washing, but it does say about uh, forgiveness. Um, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Uh, why do you wait? Uh, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So there it does talk about it. And Titus also mentions washing, though it doesn't specifically say baptism. It does suggest it. He says he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we wash our hands. We take baths and showers to wash our bodies. We use water to wash our clothes, our dishes, our cars, our dogs. Washing with water is very clear picture for us. And God draws on that image that we are so familiar with to help us understand what he does spiritually uh, through our faith in Jesus Christ. Basically, he washes us from our sins and makes us clean. The next symbol of baptism uh, we've already mentioned is clothing. Uh, now think about whatever uniform you wear, and whether it's military or paramilitary, uh, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. We can think about sporting uniforms um, uh, or band uniforms or, or, you know, even the decision to wear no uniform at all says a lot about who we are and what we are committed to. So when we put on Christ or when we wear Christ as a garment, we declare our allegiance to him and our submission to his authority. We are committing ourselves to um, living according to his expectations and his guidelines and his commands. So baptism is a symbol of this uh, connection and this submission to, uh, to Christ uh, as a garment, as being worn. You know, uh, we come to our third passage in John 3, the Pharisee uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, he's seeking understanding, uh, uh, he's trying to understand better what Jesus had to preach, what he was teaching. And before Jesus utters his famous, most famous line in John 3, 16, uh, he uses an analogy that confounds Nicodemus. Listen as I read to you from John 3, 3 to 7. Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of Spirit is Spirit. So do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Salvation is dependent upon being made alive spiritually by God. This new life in John 3 is described as a second birth or a regeneration. Uh, re meaning again, generation, being created again, recreation, um, or being born again. And that's a very um, well-known phrase, particularly from the Jesus movement of the 60s, uh, born again Christianity, which in my mind is a uh, redundant statement. It's saying the same thing twice. If you're born again, you are a Christian. If you're a Christian, you are born again. Jesus says it right here. Uh, 
cannot be saved unless you are born again. So let's think about that. What, what is that symbolism uh, referencing? Uh, when a baby is born, the amniotic sac in a mother's womb is broken and the amniotic fluid is released. Uh, in vernacular, we say the water is broken. Uh, a woman's water is broken. A baptism and its water point to the physical birth as a symbol of the spiritual birth that happens when one is connected with Christ. So, uh, rebirth is just another symbol of baptism here. That you're being born anew. And you can think about all that the changes that happen when a baby is born. It's a, basically a coming to life, a uh, drastic change of location and the way the world is around you, the way you perceive the world, the way you interact with the world, everything changes uh, when you are born. So um, it's a it's an excellent uh, picture for spiritual uh, transformation, spiritual birth and rebirth, you could say. Now the the one symbol that is uh, probably least recognized, the people don't notice or perhaps uh, don't care to think about is the symbol of judgment upon sin, God's judgment on sin. And we see this in several places where a baptism type event happens in conjunction with God's judgment. Some of them may be not so apparent at first. But think back to the first colossal baptism event with Noah. Uh, notice why it happens. In Genesis 6, we read, The Lord saw the wickedness of man. And so he destroys the world with a global baptismal catastrophe. But notice also that Noah is declared righteous. He has found favor in God's eyes and is spared. In baptism, there is this picture of judgment, God's judgment, and redemption. God's redemption. Both of these things we see in the flood, with the world being condemned and destroyed, and Noah being uh, redeemed, uh, receiving God's grace. Now, Peter makes this connection between Noah and baptism explicit in 1 Peter 3, uh, 18 to 22. And I just want to read this for you. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to us, bring us to God, uh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought to safety through the water. Baptism corresponds to this. Now, a baptism corresponding to this now saves you. Not a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God with a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So, Peter here points to this connection between Noah's flood and baptism and how that flood is a picture of baptism and uh, you could say well Noah you know Noah wasn't cleansed in a sense so we can't go back to our first image of being washed uh, Noah was spared he was um, saved by God that God uh, redeemed Noah that God protected Noah that God preserved Noah and so that's what Peter is pointing to. He says, look, it's not a removal of the dirt, but it's an appeal to God. And so, uh, and then he points to Jesus as having, uh, being at the right hand of God and appealing on our behalf. And so this, this um, connection between baptism and Noah's flood, and you could say, you know, the floodwaters cleansed the world. And so in that sense, the washing is still there, cleansed the world of evil people. That, no, that God had um, grieved that he created. But in the individual sense, or in the group sense with Noah and his family, then we see a preservation there, but still the, the image of baptism strongly um, present. Now, the, the second colossal baptism event, you know, it's not on the global scale, 
uh, but is colossal nonetheless, was the crossing of the Red Sea. Remember, God had judged the Egyptians and found them guilty, condemning them. And he had judged the Israelites and vindicated them with the Passover meal. Remember with the, the blood on the doorpost. Anyone who was declaring themselves to be gods was supposed to smear the blood on the doorpost and God would preserve them and spare them. Then they all went down to the Red Sea. And not only did they go to the Red Sea, but they went down into the Red Sea and through the water. But only God's chosen people came back up. On the other side, God's people came through the waters unharmed. The other people, the Egyptians, who weren't God's people, experienced God's devastating judgment. And we hear this in uh, God's own words as he's speaking to Noah. He says, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may back come back upon the Egyptians. Uh, down in verse 28, all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, none of them remained but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on the right and to the left, and uh, le right hand and on their left. And so basically uh, we have uh, God redeeming his people and condemning those who are not his people. Um, so, and, you know, once again, in the New Testament, we have a connection here. Paul this time um, connects us with this uh, Red Sea event and connects baptism to it. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, this is 1 Corinthians 10, 1, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. And so Paul here connects this baptism event uh, in the Old Testament uh, with baptism uh, of a believer uh, or uh, New Testament, I should say, uh, New Testament understanding of baptism. God's people in the Old Testament versus God's people in the New Testament. Uh, one other um, passage here about uh, baptism and its tie-in to judgment comes from Romans chapter 6. Um, and God uses these grand-scale baptism events to picture what happens to the soul of an individual as they are baptized. Listen to Romans 6, 3, and 4. Do you not know that all of you have been, who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? And remember, that death was an act of judgment by God. Uh, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So we have judgment on the cross, burial, which is the, the verdict, um, and then resurrection, which is the redemption. Um, and so we are tied in with those things as well uh, through baptism. So let's turn our attention to uh, symbolism. And uh, I'm not sure I got this slide out of order somehow. Um, there are... Uh, Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is the fifth uh, of our symbols. Sorry, I, mis I misread that. This is the fifth of our symbols, and this fifth symbol deals with receiving the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, just as Christ received the Holy Spirit in a special way at his baptism, so too do believers. Although, granted, their reception of the Holy Spirit is uh, different than Christ's. Uh, we see this in places like Acts 19, when Paul baptizes the new believers in Ephesus. It tells us that they received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, just like the disciples did at Pentecost. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' household believe, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them as well. So, in this case, their belief comes first, and the Holy Spirit before the baptism. In the last one, it was the baptism and then the Holy Spirit. But look at Peter's response. He has them baptized with water after they speak in tongues, after they receive the Holy Spirit. Today, someone might object, saying that there's no need for the water baptism. Our culture has a uh, aversion to ceremony and ritual. Uh, they don't like it. Um, they would say, look, there's no need for this. They've already received the Holy Spirit, so why go through these 
empty motions. Uh, what's the value in this ceremony? But in Peter's mind, this ritual act of baptism was the natural next step to acknowledge God's work in the new believer's life. And so I think it is important that we maintain this and that we do this. Um, God calls us to do it. And uh, e even here, when God has already spoken, Peter, it's almost like he it does it backwards and he uh, has them baptized with water. John the Baptist uh, said of Jesus' ministry that uh, he would include a uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit. And so, too, we see this connection between receiving the Holy Spirit and baptism. In the two Acts passages, it was baptism and the Holy Spirit came. Then it was the Holy Spirit came and baptism. And here John the Baptist is saying that when Jesus baptizes, he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is tied in, the reception of the Holy Spirit is tied in in all three of these passages. In Titus chapter 3, we've already read this, um, he describes faith as the washing of regeneration, so we have the water there, uh, and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So washing ties us in with baptism, regeneration, that's born again, being recreated, uh, renewal, made new again, and Holy Spirit. All these four ideas are tied together here, uh, sort of in a chiasmus, uh, a back and forth sort of picture. So rebirth through spiritual cleansing and making new, uh, making the believer new by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what faith is. That's what baptism is designed to symbolize. If we want to put these symbols together, we could say um, that baptism symbolizes one, our death with Jesus to sin, two, the spiritual cleansing that takes place while under the water, and the water, of course, symbolizes our death. Three, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so while we're under the water, in a sense, the Holy Spirit comes on us and leads to four, our spiritual rebirth uh, out of the water, uh, through the water, um, to the other side of the water, coming up out of the water. And uh, five, the putting on of Christ as clothing. And we could say that's the living out of the new life of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can see it as a sort of a progression, if that helps you to think about it, from uh, dying, so we're born sinners and we are dying, to dead, we die to our sin, from death to life through the uh, power of the Holy Spirit, and the life from life to transformation and immortality, and that would be the putting on of Christ, the wearing of Christ into eternity. So that, that's another helpful way of thinking about the symbols of baptism. Now, Chet concludes the study um, with five directed questions to help determine where the new believer is in their spiritual journey, specifically in regards to baptism. <clears throat> These are each designed to open up a conversation in places that would help the unbeliever or the new believer progress in their faith, help the unbeliever come to belief, or help the new believer take the next step of faith. So let's go through these questions one at a time. Uh, first question, have you repented of your sins and received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? And this first question is to ensure that the new believer has truly accepted Christ. If not, this is where the discussion should remain focused for as long as it takes for God to bring that person to faith. My hope is, after six lessons, uh, they have come to faith, that they uh, have you know, committed themselves to all this time to reading God's Word and studying it. That's my hope. But <clears throat> it's always good to confirm and um, reassure uh, the, the, the new believer, as well as yourself, uh, of where their faith stands. But if they've accepted Christ and this, they're able to confirm, uh, and you don't need to stay here and uh, spend tons of time discussing what it means to accept Christ, then you go on to the next question. Question two is a simple yes or no question. Have you been baptized? Uh, since Jesus commands his followers to be baptized, we should encourage all those professing faith to adhere to his command. Just as Peter moved uh, to baptism, even after the Holy Spirit had already been poured out on Cornelius' household, it's, it's never too late 
to baptize a believer. Somebody hasn't been baptized and they believe in Jesus, then they should be baptized and they should want to be baptized. If they don't, to me, it's suggesting that maybe they aren't truly saved. If they understand that uh, their Lord has commanded them to be baptized and they want to disobey, that's a problem. But rather than be di dictatorial about this, uh, we want to help people see things from God's perspective uh, using his words. And so uh, we move on to the next question. If they answer no, they haven't been baptized, but they answered yes to the first question. The next question then is if, if, you, if you haven't been baptized, why should you be baptized? And we want to look to scriptures for the answer to this, and hopefully this lesson has provided them with many answers to this. Um, you may need to help them articulate this, uh, guide them through. You may need to go back over some of the questions before, but uh, they should want to be baptized. They should know that their Lord wants them to be baptized, and that should be enough. Um, and then all the other things are icing on that cake. Matthew 28, 19 is a great place to start when looking for an answer to this question about why should a believer be baptized. And it answers it in two ways. First of all, it commands submission to Christ. Here Jesus says, teach them to obey everything I command. All right, so if you're a follower, a disciple, then you should be obeying Christ's commands. What's one of his commands? Well, that's the second reason for being baptized here. One of his commands is to be baptized, to baptize disciples in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So uh, disciples submit to Christ's command. Christ commands us to be baptized. Therefore, we are baptized. So that, that really should be enough. Uh, if it's not, it may take time. It may take some work. But this is uh, definitely an important issue that you want to stick to and make sure that they get. And fi the final question is a call to action. And it says this, if you haven't already, will you make a public commitment to Christ um, and ceremonially confess Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? You maybe have already done it personally, but the ceremony of confessing publicly is important. Uh, Peter understood that in Acts 10. Again, go back to that passage with Cornelius. And will you do this at the earliest possible opportunity uh, through baptism or membership at your local church? So if you're a believer and you've been baptized but aren't a member, uh, you know, this is an encouragement to join the church and make your uh, faith profession public. If you uh, have never been baptized, this is a, an encouragement to go ahead and um, do that. So um, baptism is a beautiful ritual. It's a, it's a ritual, which is sort of a dirty word in our culture, but it's beautiful. And it doesn't need to be a dirty word. It's a ritual that's filled with meaning and symbolism. It's a ritual that is commanded by our Lord for all his followers to observe. We do want to make sure that the new believer doesn't walk away thinking that this uh, baptism is the thing that's going to save them. Baptism is not a saving action. Uh, you cannot save a person by dunking them in water. It doesn't work. But it is a beautiful picture of a salvation that is uh, truly present in the life of the believer. So it is the ceremonial rite of passage into the family of God. It is initiated by God himself, uh, and, and it's uh, commanded by the words and actions of Jesus. And it is designed to distinguish believers from unbelievers. That in itself should be enough to make somebody want it, to say, I want to be different. I want to mark my distinction. I want God to recognize that distinction. And I want that distinction to be recognized in the way that God celebrates and that God commands. So it's a beautiful ceremonial ritual, a rite of passage into God's family. Now, a number of our texts have been that we've been uh uh, reviewing today uh, have baptism themes and any one of them could work well as a memory verse but Titus 3 5 uh, 
it is an excellent reminder of how we were saved as well as the connection with baptism. And it says this, God saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And again, if you don't like this translation, um, I prefer the newer international version, but you can cho choose whatever version you like. And of course, you can pick one of the other verses that we studied or another verse altogether. But uh, this is a good one uh, for a memory verse this week. So let's close with prayer. Thank you. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of baptism and the way it speaks to our hearts and encourages us. Thank you for the beautiful picture we see in it. Continue to use that power, uh, the power of your sacraments, baptism and communion in our lives to encourage our faith and strengthen our resolve as we strive to live this life for you and to your glory. Help us as we nurture the faith of young believers, as we mentor them, as we disciple them. Uh, give us wisdom and insight beyond our own learning. And help us to lift high your name. We pray this all in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Thank you for joining me. And God bless you. And good night.